Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Julia Priestley, and I'm one of the joint CEOs of the BTF. I'm delighted that so many of you have been able to join us tonight for what will be the fourth in our series of Meet the Expert webinars. Although we're very sorry not to have been able to host face-to-face -face events over the last year, these online meetings have been a really fantastic chance for so many more people to get together and to hear specialists talk from uh, specialist talks from the leading professionals in the thyroid world and for you to put your questions to them. So I'd like to welcome our three experts tonight who between them have a huge amount of knowledge about radioactive iodine therapy and how it's used to treat people with hypothyroidism. We're very grateful that they've each found the time in their very busy schedules to make this meeting happen tonight. Firstly, I'd like to introduce you to our chair this evening, Dr. Salman Razvi. Dr. Razvi is a consultant endocrinologist at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Gateshead, and he's one of our medical advisors at the British Thyroid Foundation. And as well as looking after patients and lecturing medical students, Dr. Razvi is very involved in research into thyroid disorders. And his particular research interest is into the action of thyroid hormones on different parts of the body and in particular, the cardio cardiovascular system. Before I hand over to Salman, I just wanted to make a few housekeeping points. We are recording today's session and the recording will be made available on our YouTube channel. And we'll send you this link after this meeting so you can watch it again and share it with friends and family in your own time. If you have any questions for the speakers, please type them into the Q&A box, which I think you'll find at the bottom of your screen at any stage in the meeting. And our experts will do their best to answer your questions in the time we've got. But if we do run out of time and don't get around to answering your question, you're very welcome to send in your questions after the event and we'll do our best to get your answer then. And just one final point, our speakers are only able to give out very general information and they won't be able to advise you in respect of any of your specific inquiries. So if you have any questions about your own situation or treatment, please do consult with your own doctor. So I think that covers everything from me and I'd now like to hand you over to Salman. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, Julia. And it's real pleasure to be with all of you this evening in what promises to be a really interesting hour or so of information and knowledge from two experts that we have today. Radioactive iodine is something that a lot of endocrinologists, clinicians would be familiar with. We use it all the time in both hyperthyroidism, the management of hyperthyroidism as well as thyroid cancer treatments. And I'm sure a number of people in the audience would be uh, familiar with, with, with this modality of treatment. It is termed various things, you know, blasting the thyroid, you know, roasting the thyroid. I've heard lots and lots of um, euphemisms, I, I, I would call them, for, for radioactive iodine. But one thing to remember, and I'm sure our, our speakers will bring this up in the talks, it's been around for an incredibly long time. If I remember correctly, the first patient was treated way back in the early 1940s. Uh, with, with this treatment. So it's 70 years now since it's been around. So uh, without wasting more time, let me first introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Glenn Flux. Glenn is the head of radioisotope physics at the Royal Marsden Hospital and at the Institute of Cancer Research. He leads a team of clinical and research scientists and provides support for nuclear medicine with his research focus on quantitative uh, imaging and dosing, uh, you know, what kind of dose to give for molecular radiotherapy, all kind of, you know, hi-fi stuff. He's a chair of uh, the British uh, Nuclear Medical Society of Molecular Radiotherapy Group and member of several international committees. He has a strong interest in generating, you know, multidisciplinary collaborations and runs and supports multi-center clinical trials to investigate the right dose for uh, molecular radiotherapy. So over to you, Glenn.
Thank you very much. So um, let's just make sure that we can share the screen. Okay. Is that working? Give me a thumbs up, Julia. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, yes, indeed. Um, it's fabulous to be here. So I do really want to thank uh, Julia and the BTF for the um, invitation to speak here. Um, I am going to talk to you about the physics aspects of radioiodine. And I'm quite aware that, um, you know, physics isn't always people's favorite subject. I hated it at school, actually, um, to start with. Uh, so I'll try and keep it kind of fairly light, but I'll have a couple of slides here, which you would be able to refer to since they're going onto the YouTube channel that might be of interest later on. I want to start um, with uh, actually the history. So we're going into what Salman said. We are actually um, celebrating at the moment, the 80th anniversary, pretty much to the day of when radioiodine therapy was first used. So I want to do just one slide on that because I just love the story. Um, it starts in 1934 when the physicist Enrico Fermi, brilliant man, bombarded elements with neutrons and he made artificial radioactive isotopes. Okay, two years after that, um, another brilliant physicist, Carl Compton, thought this might be useful for medicine, although he didn't know how. So he gave a lecture at the Harvard Medical School, which he called What Physics Can Do for Biology and Medicine. And in the audience was a young endocrinologist um, by the name of Saul Hertz. And he immediately saw the potential. And he said in the lecture, would it be possible to make radioactive iodine that I could use to treat my patients? So Carl Compton thought about this for a few weeks. We never moved too fast in physics and said yes. And then a team was put together, which included Arthur Roberts, a very young physicist and also a great pianist. You can find his songs on the internet. One of them is called How Lovely It Is To Be A Physicist. <laughs> um, and they also, had, uh, they also had Glenn Seaborg and John Livingood that were chemists. And basically they borrowed $37,000 built a cyclotron and started made, making radioactive iodine. And the first patient, who was a lady called Elizabeth, was treated for hyperthyroidism on Monday, March the 31st, 1941. And then they did a few patients after that. So we're actually at the 80th anniversary. Um, and soon after that, uh, my favorite ever physicist, Leo Marinelli, devised a system for calculating radiation doses. This is about the first time that like radionuclides and physics were put together with biology. And we still, we still kind of grapple with that. It's fantastic. So the two main things that I love about this are, firstly, it shows the combination of physics with uh, clinicians and particularly endocrinologists here. The whole field of nuclear medicine came out of this. And the second thing that I love is that it was seven years from first making a radioactive isotope to injecting a patient with it. Um, I can tell you these days, seven years is as long as it takes to write a grant application. So what is radiation? Um, let's, let's just look at the basic question there because many people don't know, and it is quite a scary concept to a lot of people. Radiation actually is nothing more than energy. There are various forms of energy. Um, if at the moment you are sitting down, then you have potential energy. If somebody kicks the seat out from underneath you, that's converted into kinetic energy. When you hit the floor with a bump, some of it is converted into heat energy. You would have done this at school. Um, and radiation is nothing more than energy that is emitted. So each decay of a radioactive iodine atom emits two little bits of radiation that we are particularly interested in. And the first one is gamma rays, responsible for turning Bruce Banner into the Incredible Hulk. 
which some of us think is a true story. Um, so the gamma rays um, are basically just high energy light and they shoot out of a patient and we can, if we want to, capture them on our super cameras and turn them into images. If your eyes were good enough, you would be able to see gamma rays and we would have to make up names for it, new colours. And the second emission are beta particles. And really, you can just think of those as very small billiard balls, and they just come out and they smack into nearby cells and kill them. So it's really a fairly basic thing. So how does the radioiodine actually work? Um, it's really nice. It's a very simple and elegant method of how it works. And as Salman said, it has um, a few very colourful terms, which is one of the delights of working in this area. So the thyroid, as we all know, produces hormones that keep the metabolism in check. And the um, thyroglobulin protein um, is converted to make the hormones when it takes on iodine atoms. So T3 has three iodine atoms and T4 has four iodine atoms. And so when the radioactive iodine is given, the cells are damaged and destroyed. I kind of think of it as a kind of a Trojan horse therapy. So you start the radio, you start the thyroid of iodine, and then you give it radioactive iodine, and it sucks up the radioactive iodine and it destroys the cells. We do a lot of treatments very similar to this for cancer. Um, it's worth mentioning that this really is what we call a highly targeted treatment. Um, I do not know in all of cancer, actually, another treatment that is more targeted than this. You get the activity, it goes where it's supposed to go to. And a lot of people in the field refer to it still as the magic bullet. Saul Hertz at the beginning said he thinks that this is the key to all cancer treatments. The procedure, um, it's going to vary a little, so I can only tell you based on my experience, but I've, I've been doing this for about 25 years now. The procedure is quite simple. Um, so it's not uncommon that a patient will come in and they are really nervous and they don't really know what's going to happen, um, but it's actually quite simple. Um, you're asked to swallow a tablet, which is only about yay big. So it's a radioactive tablet. Um, it is possible that you will go into isolation if it's a large amount of activity for a cancer treatment. Um, if it's a treatment for hyperthyroidism, in the UK, um, it's usually done as a day case. But in some countries also, it will, be, um, it will mean isolation. I think in Germany, they keep their patients in for some days. Um, and then when you are discharged, you are given restrictions, which will depend on your home circumstances. And we'll come to that in a minute. In terms of side effects, um, like every drug, there, there are a list of side effects. In my experience, and Steve Heyer will, um, will have, and Salmon will um, have their own experiences. But in my experience, you certainly don't lose your hair, which is what people are scared of often when they come at least to our hospital, because it's a cancer hospital. Um, you see very rare cases of sickness, sometimes um, particularly with the cancers, but that is often in the more nervous patients. So very genuinely, the worst side effect that I see from this is that you are kept in isolation for a few days and you have to watch daytime television. Um, but of course, we're all used to that these days, aren't we? So I'm going to do one slide. Here's a couple of slides of physics. I'm, I'm afraid this is the price to pay of inviting a physicist. Um, there are a few terms in radiation treatment that you will hear. And if nothing else, here's a slide and you can refer back to it. So we won't spend long on it. Um, how do we measure radiation? Measure, radiation is measured with, in terms of how many radioactive decays there are happening at any particular point. And in this country, at least, we measure radiation in terms of becquerels, where one becquerel is one radioactive decay each second. Uh, that was named after Henry Becquerel, who discovered radiation when he carried some around in his pocket and found that his skin went red. We often talk in terms of giving millions of radioactive decays per second, so we talk about mega Becquerels, or people might talk about mega Becs because it sounds more cool. If you're dialing in from some other country, um, particularly still in the US, um, 
then you might refer to radiation in terms of Curie. And that was named after Pierre and Marie Curie. And basically one Curie is a huge amount of Becquerel's. So I'm afraid it's complicated enough as it is. And then even within the field, we don't agree with each other on what terms to use. Um, the second main concept is the half-life. So radiation, you, you know, has, or would have heard, has a half-life. And basically that is time taken for half of the radiation, radiation to decay, which can generally be in years or days or hours or hours or even seconds. It's a random process, which means that if you have one radioactive atom sitting in your hand now, you do not know when it will decay. But if you have 500 megabecquerels, 500 million radioactive decays, you do know that in a week's time, you will have just over 250 uh, megabecquerels because the half-life of radioiodine is eight days. So you hear that term a lot. And now just briefly on radiation energy. As I said, radiation is just nothing more than energy. Energy is measured in joules. Um, and the, a joule is about the amount of effort it takes to lift a pint of beer. And I give that as an example because the picture of James Joule there, who is the physicist who uh, this unit is named after, was not only a physicist, but a brewer, which some people think is kind of the ideal career but unfortunately they don't offer that officially at university. And sometimes you'll hear about electron volts, uh, which is also a type of energy that used for atoms. Um, and basically uh, one electron volt is a very small bit of a joule. And the other uh, main terms concern actually the radiation dose. If you're irradiated, this energy is deposited in some part of your tissue. And that is actually, you know, irradiation. So radiation dose tends to be measured in the unit of a gray, where one gray is one joule of energy deposited in one kilogram of tissue. And it's named after this chap, um, Hal Gray, who used to go for walks in the countryside when he was a boy. And his dad, instead of pointing out the birds, used to give him mathematical problems to solve in his head. So he had no choice but to grow up to be a genius. You will sometimes hear of people referring to the sievert also as a type of radiation dose, and it is. Um, it's a radiation dose that makes allowances for biological effects and the types of radiation. For the sake of the treatments we have here, if you hear sievert, think gray. If you hear gray, think sievert. It's one and the same. Um, that was named after Rolf Sievert, who the only thing I know about him is that he was interested in insects. And I think there maybe he's just been stung by a bee. So there are a lot of different um, kind of ways of giving treatment with radioiodine. So some treatments are given in terms of the amount of radiation, the megabecquerels or the millicurie, which is a thousandth of a curie, and some treat in terms of a radiation dose. So the physics angle of it for me is about the dose because that's where the physics is. So here's another slide where you can refer back to it um, if you want to. And I'm actually going to give you a calculation to do. I'm afraid, again, this is the price of getting a physicist along. But this is just GCSE maths. I don't know what that would equate to in the States or anywhere else. But basically, this is like maths, mathematics for 14 or 15 year olds. So if you have a daughter or a son or a nephew or a neighbor that's doing maths at school, they could calculate your radiation dose for you. So it's just to give you a feeling of what we do here to be a medical physicist. To calculate a radiation dose, you need to know how much radiation there is actually in your thyroid. So if you're given 500 megabecquerels and a quarter of that goes to the thyroid, you've got 125 megabecquerels. You need to know how long it takes to wash out. And the average is five days. And you need to know what the volume of the thyroid is because people have different volumes. So for the sake of this sum here, we will say it's 20 grams. And then you can actually calculate radiation dose to the thyroid, which is 0.16 times the uptake times the half-life divided by the mass. And if you plug the numbers into the equation here, you get 120 gray. The European Association of Nuclear Medicine 
recommends that um, somewhere like 150 gray is needed to achieve a natural euthyroid state without the need for hormone supplements afterwards. So I'm just giving you this because if you train up on that, you could become a medical physicist. That's all you need for the exam. Right, is radioiodine therapy safe? What I'm doing now is just a few questions that I have had quite a lot over the years. Um, people always wait for the physicist to come in and they say, yeah, really, really, is it safe though? Is it? The doctor always tells me it is, but do I believe him? So is it safe? So I will tell you now, I don't know. Um, there are two sources in, of information really on whether it is safe. And the main source of information that is used around the world for all safety um, calculations and procedures are based on the atomic bombs that were dropped in World War II. So basically there's been a long study going on for many years trying to work out what radiation doses the survivors got based on where they were stood. And then they followed them through to see how many cancers they got afterwards. Um, frankly, it just isn't applicable to these relatively much smaller amounts of radioiodine that we give for treatment. But it is, it does underpin all of radiation safety. So that means we try and keep it safe. There have been a few studies actually looking at radioiodine treatments, um, but they've had to work with very old data. Um, which have got very poor detail. So there are quite a few studies that say there's absolutely no risk at all. Um, there are some studies that say there may be a little risk. I'm pulling out one example because it came out just a year or two ago and it caused a huge kerfuffle. I've never seen so many people write back and say how terrible the study was. And it wasn't. And, and this uh, person, Kari Kitahara, who works for the NIH in the States, um, did a study of 18,000 patients and said that there is a risk of death from solid cancers um, by about an extra 5% if you have radioiodine and a risk of death from breast cancer by 12%. Now, a lot of people say that's nonsense and indeed the study has a lot of holes in it, but it's worth looking just what that means because Kitahara didn't say this is dangerous. She just said, you know, there might be something here. In 2018, if you look at the CRUK statistics, there were 33 deaths per 100,000 females in the population from breast cancer. If these figures were true, it would mean that there would be 40 deaths per 100,000 females. If you take that in consideration, you have a one in two chance of getting cancer in your lifetime. So it's just kind of worth being ready with these numbers. Um, we see numbers like this spewed out all the time with the COVID. Um, crisis, but it's worth getting some understanding of what they mean. Nevertheless, we act cautiously. And the second questions that we always get um, are, am I going to be a risk to my family or to my pets? Not, I must say, often asked in that order. Very often, firstly, it's, um, am I a danger to my cat? And somewhere down the line is, am I a danger to my husband? Um, Really, we don't know. There have been no clinical trials in this, and it's very unlikely that people would do them. There have been just a few studies to measure what radiation doses patients will get um, if they have a member of the family that's irradiated. And I'm just giving you the results here. Uh, this was from Guy's and St. Thomas's and from Miriam Monsieur in uh, Ghent in Belgium. So there are two ways that you can be irradiated by a member of your family that has had radioiodine. And the first is just being, just then shining at you, you know, with the, the gamma rays coming out of the body, which, which will irradiate you. And they actually measured the family, you know, they gave dose meters to the family members and then came back a week later to see how much radiation they'd picked up. And they found that in the worst case, um, well, they found that generally speaking, 90% of patients, patients, they got far less than one millisievert. So to put that into context, the average background radiation that we all get every year, because we're being irradiated at this very minute from cosmic rays in space, from the rocks, from bananas, from our own radiation. We've all got radioactive potassium in us. You pick up radiation if you um, spend too much time with somebody. So the average background radiation is 2.7 millisieverts, so three times that. And the UK legislation is that the public can have an extra one millisievert per year without a problem. Um, they also measured whether or not family members had ingested any radioiodine. 
And so they actually came along and measured um, family members directly to see if there was any uptake. And they found that in the worst cases, there was less than 100,000 times uptake in the thyroid that the patient had actually had. So that's the best information we've had. Um, so on to the conclusions, really, there we are. So radioiodine, and I'm speaking now as, you know, quite objectively, really, you know, as a physicist. So it's not, I don't actually prescribe treatment. You know, we just administer, we see to the patients um, every day um, if they're in hospital. Um, and we talk to them quite a lot, it's great. So radioiodine is really a very well handled treatment. Um, will I get cancer later in life from radioiodine? We really don't know for certain. Some say no, some say there might be a small risk. Um, I, I'm very equivocal, you know, if I don't see evidence, I don't know. I will say for sure that on the list of um, potential dangers you have in your life, it is a very, very, very long way down the list. The only way we will find out is to conduct a very large epidemiological study over 20 or 30 years where we accurately measure the radiation doses, which people think is unfeasible, but actually I think I would really like to do that, or at least get it started. Will I harm my pet? Well, yes, you will expose animals and your family to radiation from the gamma rays emitted, but the person, I mean, I've been doing this for 25 years, and each year I have had the amount of radiation that any member of your family would have. And I've had it for years. And finally, will I suffer a mutation or gain superpowers? Because I honestly think that this is what is behind a lot of the fear of radiation. And unfortunately, um, I have to say that no, I've been trying for a very long time, you will not become a superhero. Um, that's it, I just want to very quickly thank uh, my absolutely fantastic team that I have here at the Royal Marsden and to my colleagues in the field um, that are on the call here. And I'd like to thank all of you for zooming in in your own time at whatever time of the day it is um, for listening to us. And that is it. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks a lot, Glenn. That was really quite uh, lucid and eloquent. Uh, physics was never my strong point either, but I think a lot of that made sense which is saying a lot. Um, right, let's move on to the next part of today's program and we'll have questions right at the end. So our next speaker is Dr. Steve Heyer. Steve is a consultant endocrinologist based in Epsom and St. Helier University Hospital in Carshalton in Surrey. He's part of a multidisciplinary team at the Royal Marsden Hospital. Uh, where Glenn works, we've just heard, where he runs a thyroid clinic. Steve has a long-standing interest in thyroid disease and has published research in the use of calculated doses of radioiodine and the long-term outcomes. And when he does have time, he practices Tai Chi. So be careful what you ask him. Uh, right, and he has also written a book on Harold Shipman, interestingly enough. So great. So mm -hmm. with all that, let's go and hear what Steve has to say about this. Thank you very much, Salman. And I will try to share my screen when I see a button saying share screen, which I don't see at the moment. Do I just... one at the bottom, share uh, screen. Here we go, share screen and share screen. And hopefully yeah, we can see it. You can see from the beginning. Lovely. Well, um, thank you, Salman, and thank you to all you patient listeners uh, zooming in, and thank you to the BTF for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. So my topic is more clinical. Glenn has given you all the background knowledge you'll ever need for the rest of your life on physics. Um, I will try and put this into some clinical context for you. My topic is radioiodine for hyperthyroidism. And what I hope to do for the next few slides is tell you a bit about this condition, hyperthyroidism, and then the options that we use for treating it, 
and the pros and the cons for why we choose radioiodine or not. Note that we're not talking about thyroid cancer treatment here. That's a whole different subject, and that's we can do on a different occasion. So many of you will know about hypothyroidism from, from personal experience, but just for those who may need to understand it a bit more or refresh your knowledge, hypothyroidism simply means that your thyroid gland sits in your neck is overproducing thyroid hormones. And that gives rise to a clinical picture. It may be that we can just detect this on the blood test and you feel perfectly well, but depending on you and depending on the level of the hormones, you will get various symptoms which reflect the fact that your metabolic rate has suddenly gone up dramatically because of the excess thyroid hormones. So this makes you feel hot, this makes you feel shaky, your pulse rate will start to race, you may experience palpitation, you may lose weight. And some of our female patients are very happy to be losing weight and have an increased appetite, which is a great combination. You eat what you like and you lose weight, but it's not a healthy combination. Um, you may um, get other complications. And in fact, the heart may go into an abnormal heart rhythm, which is potentially dangerous. So this condition, although, we don't necessarily think of it as particularly dangerous, particularly in an older patient, can result in quite a lot of serious medical problems. So why should the thyroid go into overdrive? Well, there are three main uh, conditions that we think about. One is called Graves disease, and it's an unfortunate name, and some of our patients start to think about holes in the ground, but of course Graves was the name of the, um, actually it was an ophthalmologist, a Belgian ophthalmologist, who first described this condition. So there you go. And that is um, an auto, what we call an autoimmune condition, which means that the body makes antibodies against itself, there are plenty of examples of autoimmune conditions, such as type 1 diabetes, vitiligo, Addison's disease, pernicious anemia. In all these conditions, you make antibodies to one of the target organs. Now, unlike the other autoimmune conditions, in Graves' disease, the antibody makes the thyroid go overactive or stimulates the target. Well, whilst in most of these other conditions, the antibody causes destruction and underactivity of the target. So Graves' disease, an autoimmune condition, antibodies. These antibodies can produce problems in the eyes. And that picture shows a, a rather um, severe example of thyroid eye disease, which is related to Graves' disease. Now, another cause of an overactive thyroid is what we call a toxic nodular goiter, nothing to do with antibodies. This is where a thyroid becomes nodular, and some of these nodules become autonomous and start producing too much thyroid hormone, which loses the control, the normal control mechanisms, and the patient develops hypothyroidism. And another cause or another group of causes is an inflamed thyroid, which comes under the heading of thyroiditis. And various viruses and drugs, particularly one of the cardiac drugs called amiodarone, is um, often responsible for making the thyroid inflamed. And in this condition, the thyroid puts out a lot of thyroxine that's preformed and the patient becomes hypothyroid. Now, you may think this is all very nice and uh, um, academic, but what is the relevance of all this? Well, the relevance is that the treatment for these different causes 
is different. So the way we treat graves, the way we treat toxin nodule, toxic nodular goiter or a thyroiditis is different. So it is actually important that we try to understand what is causing the overactive thyroid in order to direct the most appropriate treatment for the patient. So how do we diagnose the different causes? We use clinical features. Um, what medication is the patient taking? We look for signs in the patient, for example, their eyes, there may be signs in their hands, there may be signs in their legs, all of which point to autoimmune condition or Graves' disease. And then, of course, we've got blood tests. We can measure the antibodies in the blood. And we've got imaging. So we can scan the thyroid and we get different pictures in different conditions. So, for example, in a Graves' thyroid with an uptake scan that you can see here, there's a diffuse increased uptake as opposed to a toxic nodular goiter where you get patchy uptake in the overactive or hot nodules as we call them. So now let's talk about how we treat the, the, uh, the overactive thyroid. And one of the medications that is, if you like, the most commonly used in this country is carbimazole. In the States, it tends to be methimazole. These are related. Carbimazole gets converted to methimazole. It's a pro-drug, and it inhibits the synthesis of thyroxin. Another drug, which has a horrible name, propylthiouracil, most people refer to it as PTU, is an alternative thionamide or antithyroid drug and is also used to slow down the thyroid in a patient with hypothyroidism. These drugs um, are very effective. Um, the advantage of carbimazole is it's usually only needs to be taken once a day as opposed to propylthiouracil, which is usually twice or three times a day. Um, both of these drugs can cause a rash and rarely they can cause a bone marrow problem where the white cells and occasionally the platelets drop dramatically. And in that situation, the patient will have to discontinue the medication. And usually by stopping the drug, the problem resolves itself. But then you can never use that drug again. Um, we do use uh, carbimazole in preference to PTU as our first line in most situations because PTU can damage the liver. It's rare, but it can do. Um, except in the situation in pregnancy where we think PTU is slightly preferable for the baby than carbimazole. So if a woman is trying to conceive uh, or is pregnant, in the very early stages, we would tend to use PTU instead of carbimazole if she's got hyperthyroidism, for example, due to Graves. We also have good old beta blockers, tried and tested, which slow the heart rate down and are useful for patients initially before the antithyroid drugs have really had a chance to work and they can protect the heart from abnormal rhythms. But do note that the treatment of particularly Graves' disease is a long treatment. It's not a short course of a few weeks or a week or something. We're talking a minimum of a year and probably 18 months. And even at the end of that time, some patients with Graves' disease, will uh, their disease will recur at the end of that time. And this is because the antibody has still persisted. It hasn't gone away and or it may have temporarily gone away and it's come back again. So that's that's very disappointing for a patient who's gone through medication for all this time and then stops it feeling well. And then the whole thing comes back again. So our good friends, the NICE committee, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, um, you will have heard of this um, 
um, body. It, this is an authority that gives guidelines to all the clinical conditions that we come across. They keep getting updated, which is very important because guidelines, as soon as they're written, become out of date. And this helps us to uh, choose the various treatments that we offer our patients. And this is, this is the latest NICE guidelines. Very recently, um, Glenn was on the committee. I was involved as well, peripherally to this. And um, the guidelines are there as um, a guide. They're not written in stone. They're not um, an absolute, but they do point us in the right direction as to what we should be doing with our patients. So what do the guidelines say about hyperthyroidism? Well, they want the primary care doctor, the GP, to initiate or consider initiating antithyroid drugs and supportive treatment while awaiting a specialist assessment. But they, they do accept that these patients with hyperthyroidism need to be seen by a, an experienced specialist because the different sorts of hypothyroidism have to be clearly defined. And those tests that I mentioned and those scans really involve hospital uh, care rather than primary care. So if you're overactive thyroid, you will be referred hopefully to an endocrine clinic. And there we, you see on this slide, the three main options for first line definitive treatment. And they are radioiodine or radioactive iodine, antithyroid drugs, which I've mentioned, carbimazole, propylthiourosol, and or surgery. So would we say to a patient, well, I think you need an operation to have your thyroid removed? That is, I have to say, a rare occurrence for a patient with hypothyroidism. It may be the option, the best option, if you have a great big enlarged thyroid, which we would call a goiter, which is compressing the major structures in the neck, or if we suspect that there may even be a malignancy as well as the overactive thyroid. So those are very special situations where um, surgery may be considered. Surgery may be considered when a patient has tried antithyroid drugs, maybe even radioiodine, and they're still persistently hypothyroid. So in other words, after all these other treatments. But I, uh, uh, surgery would not be um, the first choice for most of our patients. I have to say that if you are having surgery, it would need to be a total thyroid removal rather than um, a, a lesser operation, because if it's an overactive thyroid due to Graves' disease and you leave a bit of thyroid behind, then there's no reason why that antibody couldn't start up and stimulate that remaining bit of thyroid and you've gone through all that surgery and you're overactive again. That would be a disaster. So we'll leave aside surgery and we'll come to the other two options, which are antithyroid medication or radioiodine. So most of us, I would hazard to suggest, would go for a simple tablet to take for a year or so to treat our overactive thyroid if we had Graves' disease. On the other hand, if we have a toxic nodular goiter, we would be committing ourselves to long-term antithyroid drugs because um, as soon as we stop the antithyroid medication, the thyroid will become overactive again. It doesn't go away. It doesn't matter if it's a year or 18 months. It's not like Graves' disease where the antibody you hope disappears and therefore you can get away with that length of treatment. In a toxic nodular goiter, it will certainly recur when the medication is stopped. So one option, and this may be an option for some of our 
patients, particularly maybe frailer patients, older patients may choose this, would be long-term carbimazole or PTU treatment. That's, that is an option. Um, it's tablets. Another way um, for treating and another um, treatment that we're going to focus on tonight is radioiodine. Now, in some countries in the world, um, particularly in a patient who's a very high risk of their Graves' disease relapsing, so men do worse than ladies with Graves' disease, somebody who's got a very high thyroid level at the beginning of their presentation, um, somebody with a goiter and Graves' disease, in other words, an enlarged thyroid and Graves' disease, these patients on the whole don't do well with antithyroid medication and will tend to relapse. Patients who've got very high levels of thyroid antibodies or one year into treatment with carbimazole, they've still got very high levels of thyroid antibodies. So in other words, we can, to some extent, predict those patients who will almost certainly relapse at the end of a course of carbimazole treatment. So those patients, it would seem more logical rather than, rather than them having a year or 18 months of treatment only to relapse at the end of this treatment, to consider giving them radioiodine from the onset, from the start. And then there's that group of the toxic nodules, particularly where they have a single autonomous nodule, an overactive uh, area in the thyroid, which you can see on the scan. They do well with radioiodine because the radioactive iodine goes into that hot overactive area. It slows it down and then the rest of the thyroid takes over and the patient is hopefully cured. So, these are the, this is the thinking that goes in through our minds when we have a patient in front of us. Is the patient likely to, well, well, first of all, what is the cause of the overactive thyroid? Is the patient likely to relapse if I give this patient a long course of antithyroid medication? Is this patient suitable for radioiodine treatment? Um, would, if they have a toxic nodule, would this not be the best treatment for them? But we are only there to give advice and specialist advice. And this is a two-way process. And what I try to do with my patients is have this discussion and not to make a decision when I first see you. Um, you can think about it. I give you um, reference to particularly the British Thyroid Foundation, which has great information on these different treatments. Have, give yourself time to think about them. Go and um, discuss it with your family and your friends. And we can always, for example, start you on tablets and later go for radioiodine. There's no rush to treat with one mode or another, but there is uh, uh, some degree of urgency to get your thyroid levels down. But the longer term definitive treatment, I think, can be done in a more relaxed and leisurely way. When you've thought about it, you've taken into account the pros and the cons and made it what I would call an informed decision. So um, this is my bit about radioiodine. I've shown you here a capsule, but Glenn has told you it's a tablet. I think at one stage it was a liquid and it's capsule, it's now a tablet. No doubt it will be something else in a few years time. But anyway, um, you will not be um, advised to have radioiodine in certain situations. So no, if you are a lady trying to become pregnant or are actually pregnant or a man trying to father a child, or you are lactating, because in all those situations, iodine may affect the developing baby. And if iodine gets into the baby's thyroid, 
it will knock it out completely and the poor baby will be born with thyroidogenesis and that's a, a preventable um, condition. So absolute no-no to any woman who wants to be um, become pregnant in the six months time from the time of the radioiodine. Um, we don't give radioiodine to a patient who is biochemically thyrotoxic or hyperthyroid. We wait for the thyroid levels to come down because there's a very small risk. And I think I've only seen one or possibly two cases in all my time seeing patients with thyroid disease of a thyroid storm after radioiodine. That means that you the, you give your, your, the patient's already got high levels of thyroid hormones. They have their radioactive iodine, which releases a bit of um, thyroid hormone as well. And that on top of the overactive thyroid means the patient becomes extremely overactive. So for this reason, we always check your blood levels prior to giving radioiodine. Um, we wouldn't want necessarily to give you radioiodine if you have a very large goiter with compressive symptoms because temporarily the thyroid may enlarge, you may get a bit of radiation inflammation and that could compromise your airway or the major vessels in the neck. So that's a bit of a contraindication. Um, thyroid malignancy is a separate uh, situation so we wouldn't just give you radioiodine, there would be a whole pro uh, protocol for managing thyroid malignancy, which I won't go into now. And we would take special care for patients who have thyroid eye disease. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. <clears throat> now, Glenn has already kind of alluded to the fact that um, radioiodine, the activity that we give and or the dose that we give, and those are not the same things. Um, up and down the country, there is a, a one size fits all kind of approach, which is straightforward and tends to be the, the pragmatic approach, which means that everybody gets a certain amount of activity, uh, usually about four to 600 megabecquerels. And that's then you go away, you have your blood test, we see what your level is, and sooner or later, everybody will become hypothyroid and will need thyroxine replacement. Um, another approach, which is still, I would say, a research approach, although it is still used in some parts of the world, is to try to calculate the dose of radioiodine that the thyroid will receive, that the thyroid will absorb, and work out the dose for that particular patient and aim to try to give the patient a minimum amount of radioactivity, which is important. We don't want to give excess radioactivity. That's important for patients. It's important for the environment as well. Um, and also try to keep the patient with a normal thyroid, which means euthyroid, normal thyroid levels, for as long as possible. But even the calculated dose advocates, which would include me, have to accept that over time, and that may be years, it's likely that the patient will eventually become underactive, their hypothyroid, uh, thyroid becomes underactive and they will need thyroxine. But, you know, a few years of normal thyroid or more may be still an advantage to many people. But that we can discuss more of that in the discussion. So you say to me, well, what are the advantages of this treatment? Well, it's you've seen it's a tablet, it's non-invasive, it's very easy. You just swallow the tablet, take a, a warm drink afterwards, usually a cup of tea, and go home. That's great. That's it. Done and dusted. It's definitive, simple. I would say it's very safe, um, but Glenn's already given you much more detail on that. It's also cost effective because um, other treatments involve um, a lot more um, 
clinic appointments and interventions. Once the patient is uh, under act, the thyroid is underactive, they will be on thyroxine and hopefully, unless their weight changes dramatically, will be on the same dose forevermore. Okay, so you've seen the advantages, simple, easy to use, been around for 80 years. We know all about it. We know its pros and its cons. What about its disadvantages? Okay, there is a short-term disadvantage that you've heard already that you have to have limited contact with other people, maybe your family, maybe children in the family. Maybe you can't go back to work immediately because you work with children or because um, you, you are in contact with pregnant mums. Um, you have to delay starting a family potentially because we don't want you to get pregnant within six months of having your radioiodine or we delay in fathering a child if you're a man. So those are, um, if you like, short-term, medium-term problems. Um, the, I've mentioned the thyroid storm, which I would say is an avoidable risk, which is very unusual and unlikely to happen. But there is this problem that the eyes can worsen with radioiodine. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. Here you see a patient whose eyes look worse on the top panel, whose eyes have since got better. Um, and also, one other disadvantage is that in the long term, you are very likely to need thyroid hormones to take every day for the rest of your life, because if the thyroid becomes underactive, it will be permanent. It's not a temporary thing. So this is just to show you a rather old slide, but it's a very classic paper. It's always referred to, and it shows, as you see, that the patients who received radioiodine um, here, you can see that a small number in this study got worsening of their eyes after they had radioiodine. And here you see when they were given prednisolone, which is a steroid hormone with the radioiodine, you can see none of their eyes got worse. So what does that mean to us? That means that we, if we have a patient who's got thyroid eye disease and we tend to avoid giving radioiodine to patients with very severe thyroid eye, but if they've got mild thyroid eye disease, we would give prednisolone, the steroid treatment with the radioiodine um, to avoid that complication. And it, it is very effective. So we can mitigate that risk. And so for my final slide is just a mention about the thyroid hormone replacement. So many of you will be taking levothyroxine. He's your friend or she's your friend. Um, but there are some important points about taking levothyroxine. It, as you will know, it should always be taken on an empty stomach food interferes with the absorption. And we see patients who've got funny thyroid levels, fluctuating levels. People give them more levothyroxine. And in fact, the, the, the key is that they're not uh, taking it on an empty stomach. So um, it should, that's key. Also, other medications interfere with levothyroxine. So if you're also on calcium supplements or iron supplements or uh, proton pump inhibitors for your uh, hyperacidity or peptic ulcers treatment. None of those treatments should be taken at the same time because they interfere with levothyroxine. And take it with a glass of water, but not with coffee because coffee again interferes with the absorption. Some patients will actually tell us that the brand of levothyroxine matters and that when their chemist gives them one brand, they get different levels to another. And actually, I believe the patients because in the levothyroxine tablet, there are other compounds which we call excipients. And in some patients, those excipients can cause a problem with absorption. So it may be best to stick to the same brand if you can. 
So with that, I thank you for your attention and hope to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Right, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, that was very uh, informative and very helpful. I'm sure a lot of our viewers would have benefited a lot from that already. Now to the questions, we have 30 plus questions. So I can't guarantee we'll get through all of them because of the limitation on time. We are meant to have finished around now. So if everyone's okay and happy, we can extend this by say another 10 or 15 minutes. Is that all right with everyone? In which case, I would suggest that we try and give very succinct one-liners if we can. Uh, shall we start off with the first one? Somebody with um, obviously receiving radioactive iodine therapy, but who has a very strong family history of breast cancer. Is that a no-no or would you still consider it? Glenn or Steve, whoever. I would still consider it. Okay. Glenn, any, any, anything to add? You're muted, Glenn. <clears throat> um, in terms of the physics advice, then certainly I would still consider it, yes. There's no reason why there's a bigger predisposition towards radioactive um, irradiation. Yeah, and I would agree with that, I'll concur completely. Next question is, how long would somebody receiving radioactive iodine for Graves' disease typically need to stay away from children who's, who's a close contact? How long? Glenn? There's a lot of variation on this and a lot <laughs> of different ideas. So I'm not going to give a definitive answer. I will say that because of the variations, um, we're just starting a working group in the UK to see if we can consolidate and get some agreement on what those discharge criteria would be. But I think you'd agree, Glenn, it will be a matter of days. We're not talking... I'm not agreeing anything without yeah. knowing the activity or what it is. I mean, you know, how much activity, mm. what are the circumstances, what's the disease, what's the uptake? Yeah, I mean, yes, I the question says, forever is. <laughs> yeah, the question says Graves' disease. So I'm assuming it's about 400 megabecquerels. Yeah. So it could be, if it's this country, uh, yeah, it could be four, but it could be 800 megabecquerels in this country as well. So I'm basically, you should very definitely, everybody should get this information from their clinician or from their physicist at their hospital. And I would say very strongly, if you're not happy or if you're not clear, then press and ask again, because you should be very clear on what criteria are. Okay. I mean, typically in our hospital, we advise uh, people at least 14 days is, is kind of typical. But again, I, I take your point mm -hmm. about that. The next question is about how long is it safe to delay radioactive iodine and surgery a year after starting on anti-thyroid drugs? I'm not sure there's a safety element it's more a clinical. Yeah, I uh, agree. Concern. Yeah, to I agree. Try so. and normalize the, the, the levels as much as yeah. we can rather than a safety issue behind this. Yeah, I agree. I, as long as your levels are good, you can wait as long as you like. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. After radioactive iodine, is it likely that the immune system will attack another part of the body? I wouldn't have thought so. No evidence. <clears throat> Yeah. Has anyone started to consider using radio frequency ablation instead of radioactive iodine? That's a good question. Ooh. I've heard of radio frequency ablation for, for nodules, and it's become a popular, uh, pretty non invasive way of treating lumps in various organs. Um, so, yes, for a nodule, I haven't heard of it for treating hyperthyroidism no me, me neither and and i would agree and concur <clears throat> it's a single nodule it could potentially be 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 a modality of treatment but something like graves disease where the entire thyroid is affected mm. uh, radio frequency wouldn't be a feasible uh, option even to consider so yeah. we, we, there's no real data or ongoing project that i'm aware of mm. 
There's somebody here who says they had radioactive iodine many years ago and had been relatively stable for years on levothyroxine, but that's gone completely haywire now. Why when she, I'm assuming it's a she, but when they have no longer have working thyroid, does it fluctuate at all? I suspect a part of that answer would have been in the last slide that Steve shared. It related to how and when you take the thyroxine, other circumstances, other medications, other conditions, body weight, um, and, and, and so on. Yes, um, we have a protocol for what we call a thyroid absorption test, where we get patients in, we measure their uh, TSH and their thyroid hormones, and then we give them under supervision a dose of thyroxine, levothyroxine, and then we measure the kinetics and everything else to, to absolutely define what's going on. And in some small number of cases, you find that the levothyroxine is being cleared from the system very quickly. They've got a problem with their binding proteins, but that's quite unusual. But more often than not, it's, as you say, it's interfering substances. And when you give it under the right conditions, they absorb it perfectly well. So yes, you have to pay a lot of attention to how patients are taking it and the brand of thyroxine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, It, it, it could be different uh, brands. Mm. Although yeah. hopefully recently that would have been less of a concern with the mm. tightening of, of the, yeah. of the uh, molecule itself. Yeah. Right. Next question is, how long does it take for overactivity to disappear after radioactive iodine? Will it go immediately or will mm. they have to stay on antithyroid drugs for a while? It's a good question. Uh, it doesn't go immediately. Um, it, uh, it, some pay well, Glenn will explain that the, the kinetics of how the, the iodine is absorbed into the thyroid, but in some patients, it will quite, maybe after six weeks, it's when we review the thyroid levels, they will have come down, but in some patients, it takes even six months. So we have a cutoff of about six months before we would even consider giving another dose of radioiodine. But generally, it's a matter of weeks to months. It's not immediate. OK. Mm. Would you like to add anything, Glenn? No. No? OK, great. Um, how often will I have checkups after radioactive iodine? I'm nervous about going hypothyroid and it not being picked up. Mm. I mean, in a good center, you should have, I mean, any center, you should have a plan as to how you detect people. No center should administer radioactive iodine and then say, well, come back if you have problems. Mm. Every patient will have tests done at fixed time intervals and sooner if there are symptoms or if, if there are new symptoms. And typically it tends to be, as Steve said, six weeks, three months, six months, and a year after. Yeah. Um, anything else to add? Uh, just to say that we don't actually need to see you. We do this, what we call a virtual clinic, which you're all familiar with now with COVID, but we, we've been doing this for a long time for our thyroid patients. So you need, you have a whole series of forms for blood tests and we monitor them in our virtual clinic. So we know what your levels are doing. We may need to see you, but typically the patient doesn't keep coming up to the clinic. They just keep having blood tests. Thank you. Next question, is radioactive iodine ever considered for hyperthyroid patients with thyroid eye disease? If so, are there any precautions patients can take before starting treatment? I think you covered that a bit. Uh, yes, yes. So uh, the, the, the simple answer is we do give it, except in very severe thyroid eye disease, only with steroid cover, and we would have an ophthalmologist assess you prior to doing this, to make sure your eye disease is stable. We would not do it when the eye disease is considered active um, and um, unstable. Thanks. Why are endocrinologists against the use of anti-thyroid drugs? Question for you, what? Steve. <laughs> I, I wasn't aware that we're anti-thyroid. I dish them out like smarties most of the time. Um, we. What we want to do is to do the best for our patients, but patients' will views must be taken into account. And um, this is a discussion to be had with the patient. The, the medication can cause problems. 
the radioiodine can cause problems, surgery can cause problems. There's no ideal treatment. And there's, as far as I know, there's no treatment on, in anything that we do that's 100% safe that has no downside to it. So all we're doing in medicine is balancing the pros and the cons, the risks and the relative benefits and the disbenefits. So yeah, um, we don't have a like or a dislike. We, we try to balance things for the individual in front of us. Right, next one. How long would you need off work after radioactive iodine? Does this vary depending on your job? In that, this person's job, they're required to work in close contact with people. Glenn might be better placed to answer this. Um, <clears throat> again, it, it's difficult to generalize and you would need to get very specific advice after giving very specific details to your center. But obviously, if you've got a lot of um, close contact, you would probably be advised to stay away longer. Um, obviously, if you have contact with children, you'd stay away longer. So to some extent, there are actually uh, limitations that are written down on levels of activity. And what we have to do when people leave is to try and estimate when people will reach that level. Um, but again, I would say as before, questions, such questions, you know, very much direct them at your center and be happy with the answer. Thank you. This one's uh, probably for you, Steve. Would radioactive iodine be suitable for someone with both blocking and stimulating antibodies? Because no. they're alternating hyper and hypothyroidism with mm. Graves' disease. It's an interesting question, and it probably needs a bit more research to, to give a, a definitive answer. It is the case that some patients with blocking antibodies go through a hyper phase and then become spontaneously hypothyroid. So it would be wrong to give those patients um, radioiodine because they're going to become underactive themselves if they <coughs> wait long enough. So um, I think the answer is that we would need to, this is why you need a specialist assessment when the patient presents. We need to take account of them. It's not an absolute because we do use radioiodine even with blocking antibodies. And I would also say that most centers that measure the so-called TSH receptor antibody as a stimulating antibody don't have a bioassay to know whether that what they're measuring is actually stimulating or blocking because it is possible that you can have a, a hypothyroid patient with TSH receptor antibodies that act as blocking. So it's quite a complicated business, I can tell you, but it's not an absolute. Right, next one, and I think I can clump this and another question I've seen further down together. Does radioactive iodine reduce either female or male fertility and can it cause birth defects? Um, well, um, I can answer the fertility one because we did look at this some years ago. We published a paper on this and there was no evidence that it affected fertility. Um, we did notice a temporary hormonal change, but it didn't affect long-term fertility. So that's, uh, that's the evidence we have. Um, in terms of birth defects, the, the key one to worry about is the thyroid of the fetus. So that is developed very early on, 12, 15 weeks, and mainly in the first trimester or a bit earlier, actually. And um, if the woman is exposed to radioiodine mm -hmm. at that time, the iodine will go into the fetus thyroid and destroy it. So that's the main one. Other birth defects, I'm not sure that there are any recognized ones. There is a recognized one with, with carbimazole, which is called uh, cutis laxa or aplasia, la la uh, cut a aplasia cutis which is a scalp defect, which babies can get. Again, it's exceptionally rare, but I have seen one case. Right, uh, probably this one's for you, um, Glenn. Probably, um, how does radioactive iodine know to target the thyroid and not go into any other organ? <laughs> <laughs> I like that question. Brains. Um, the um, iodine is, I think, the heaviest element that is used uh, by the body. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so it's got a very it's got a very specialized function. It's not something the body uses very much. Um, and it is taken up by special receptors that are on the cellular surface. And there's this kind of complicated feedback mechanism. So you need the sodium iodide symporter on, sitting on the surface to pull it in. And this is something that really the iodine, the, the, the thyroid specializes in. So it pulls in the iodine, it takes these thyroglobulin uh, proteins that have been sequenced and it bungs them together and kicks out as thyroid is that I think that um, lactating breast can also take up iodine, but it's just not something that's used by the rest of the body. And that's why it is so well targeted. Yes, perfect. Right. So we are about halfway through our questions. You'd be pleased to know. Um, well, between all these, there's a big thank you from, from one of these attendees. So no, thank you for your thank you. Uh, next one is relationship between radioactive iodine and fertility. I think we have covered that. <laughs> Does the radioactive iodine treatment interact with the genetic makeup of an individual? Glenn. No. Okay, thank you. What risk and percentage do you quote for risk of thyroid eye disease with radioactive iodine during a consultation? Steve. I don't quote numbers like that um, because, again, it, it's very individualized. Um, I refer patients to BTF literature on uh, radioiodine and so on. And uh, if I can make a little plea for the difference between relative risk and absolute risk. So um, if I buy two lottery tickets instead of one, I double my chance of winning the lottery. But my absolute risk or my absolute chance of winning the lottery remains infinitesimally small. So your absolute chance of getting these problems is very low, even though the risk is increased, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. So next question is, a lady had a total thyroidectomy in 1997 for Graves disease. And she then became hyperthyroid again, post-thyroidectomy. So I'm assuming it couldn't have been a near total. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and in 2016, a scan showed a regrowth to sixth eighth of the original size. Is radioactive iodine okay for thyroid regrowth? Well, <laughs> As you say, it couldn't have been a total, it, and I don't even believe it. Well, there, there may be some regrowth, but there was definitely a sizable remnant after that surgery. Um, yes, radioiodine is ideal in that situation, and probably an ablative dose. Perfect. Mm. Uh, diagnosed with hyperthyroidism due to Graves a couple of months ago, and currently trying to learn as much as possible about this condition. I keep reading that radioactive iodine can trigger thyroid eye disease. Is this true? It, there is a small number in that paper that I quoted of patients who developed de novo thyroid eye disease, but um, it's very unusual. It's usually a progression of existing thyroid eye disease. So um, it's, it, is, it is recognized that you can, it can happen, but it's very unusual. Thank you. A friend with a thyroid storm was operated on 40 years ago and a sliver was left and she has not had to have any levothyroxine in all this time. Would you not consider leaving a sliver in future? I think that's more targeted to the surgeons and I don't think we have a surgeon in our midst today. Yeah. But I, what I can say is it's very unusual and I think you can't really predict one sliver from the other, everyone's different. I think your friend being incredibly lucky, but most uh, people wouldn't be. The majority will still go underactive. And as we have heard with the previous question, some with, depending on how much is left, can again become hyperthyroid. And you don't really want to be putting people into repeated operations uh, again and again. So I think that's the real reason why we don't consider leaving any bits of thyroid currently for Graves' disease, certainly. Mm. Next one, most patients are administered radioactive iodine or thyroidectomy with a view to converting the patients to a hypothyroid stage. 
and treat them with levothyroxine in the long term. Why is that? Could they not be instead be treated with carbimazole lifelong? Well, they could. And we do have some patients who are on lifelong. But um, if you ask me, well, would I prefer to be on the natural, normal hormone that my body makes, thyroxine, except in the tablet form, but in, uh, in all other ways, identical? Or would I rather be on a drug that uh, is, uh, inhibits the thyroid production? I would go for the natural, normal thyroxine, thank you. But that's my own opinion. Okay. Is there a protocol that could mitigate any potential adverse long-term outcomes resulting from radioactive iodine treatment? Well, the, we do mitigate by ensuring that the blood levels are good prior to surgery, uh, assessing the eyes carefully prior to surgery, giving steroids if needed prior to, prior to the radioiodine, I mean, sorry. Um, and closely monitoring the patients afterwards. So all those are good practice and they are mitigations, I would, I would argue. Right. Is this patient right to worry that even after radioactive iodine is carried out, Graves' antibodies are still present and therefore can attack the eyes or another organ? Well, that is true. Um, well, not another organ, but um, it is... That is the reason why you can still get thyroid eye disease. We don't use, at the moment, there is research about this, but we don't use <coughs> immunotherapies to try to reduce the thyroid antibodies. We treat the thyroid, so, which is the end organ that's being attacked. So um, in the future, we may be using a totally different approach, which would be to look at trying to remove or neutralize the antibodies responsible. But at the moment, that, that treatment is still in research uh, stage. Right, thank you. I think at this stage, I must ask the panel, the number of questions seems to be increasing every time <laughs> I scroll down. Do we want to go through all of them or shall we take a pick of them or do we draw a line at some point? What does everyone feel? I'm okay to continue um, for my part. Yeah, I don't mind if Julia's happy. Julia, you, you, if, you, you, if you're happy to give your time and um, <laughs> this is a wonderful opportunity for, for everybody to ask questions. So thank you very much. Um, I've Great. got to until 11 o'clock and then I... <laughs> You've got yeah, I was going to say, midnight is usually my cutoff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right, some endocrinologists believe that effects of radioiodine can kick in several years after administration. How likely is that? Um, I'm not quite sure what they mean, but what they might be saying is that a patient may remain youth thyroid. That means the thyroid levels are good for many years and they become hypothyroid maybe 10 years later or even longer. And yes, we do see that occasionally, particularly when we give very low doses of radioiodine. Um, and that may be an advantage to a patient. And I would argue it is an advantage to stay euthyroid for as long as possible. So yes, the effect, the, there may be a delayed effect on thyroid function, indeed. How is radioactive iodine, uh, Glenn, for you, different from isotope uptake scan? What's the difference? Um, so basically radioiodine is the radioactive drug that you take. And the uptake scan is the imaging that we do that I showed on that early slide that shows where the radioactivity goes to. And the isotope is just, it's another name for the radioiodine. So basically the uptake scan images the radioiodine. I hope that makes sense. Right. If it's okay, I'm going to skip the next one because I think it's slightly off uh, the syllabus. It's about T3 and you know, not getting on with T4. So I think we can leave that to another day because that's a whole topic by itself. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yeah. Does radioactive iodine affect the liver the way other medications can affect it over a long pe period of time? No, no. 
Can carbimazole be taken with levothyroxine or should there be an, an hour's gap as part of block and replace? Um, it can be taken together um, in block and replace. Fine. How long would you have to isolate from a baby if uh, you have been given radioactive iodine? I think we've answered this kind of question before. Any special consideration for babies, uh, Glenn? Um, radioiodine wise, I don't think you would give radioiodine to, uh, um, you, you'd just be uh, more careful. I mean, again, this is all just down to time limits. Um, I can't remember what the actual numbers were. Last, last time I looked, it was something like 30 megabecquerels for children, but you would, you would be a lot more cautious. We tend to be really, really overcautious when we give advice about children and particularly babies. We very much play on the safe side. Yeah. This person works in a secondary school and is due to go back three days after radioactive iodine. Is this okay? Uh, very much, again, just talk to your center. It depends, again, very much on how much radioiodine you were given, um, what the uptake might have been, what the circumstances are. Um, so, you know, you must get specific advice on that. And they, yeah, they and should, really should provide you that. Yeah, and depending on what job you do, how much contact you come Absolutely. to with other people. So if you stay in a room and not come in contact with anyone at all, which is unlikely, but, you know. Um, I, mean, I would suspect that three days sounds like a very short time if it, you're going into a school. I mean, the, the better, you know, look at it this way, it, would you want somebody going into a school three days after they've been given radioiodine if you're a parent of a child? So I suspect it might be a bit longer. Yeah. But do check. Is the dose or procedure of giving radioactive iodine any different for teenagers compared to adults? In my experience, it's about the same, but um, certainly the procedure is the same. Um, if you've got a good hospital, then it might have a specific isolated room if you need to be in isolation. Um, I don't think, I don't know if the dose has changed. That's down to you too. Again, I'm not aware of any uh, big changes in dose no. uh, for teenagers, mm -hmm. certainly. Ooh, this is probably a question for you. Uh, Julia, does anyone know if there has been a webinar on total thyroidectomy? Uh, our first webinar was about thyroid surgery. Okay. You, cool. If you go to our website, you can find a recording of that as well. And a transcript of the whole thing as well, all the questions. Fantastic. If Graves is a cause of the hyperthyroidism, why do you treat the hyperthyroidism and not the cause? Why can't Graves' disease be treated? Good question, Steve. Very good question, and we're working on it, as they say. Um, lots of research going on, particularly in Newcastle, which is looking at ways of treating the cause, which, in fact, uh, although we know the antibody sets the process off, we still don't really understand what causes the antibody in the first place. Um, we know that certain people have a tendency to make autoantibodies, but um, we don't really know why you become, you develop Graves today and not six months ago. So it's a research question, but it's a very good question. And I'm sure that in the future, we will be treating Graves in a totally different way. I agree. Hmm. Right. If this patient has radioactive iodine, how does she know well, how do they know they'll be able to tolerate the levothyroxine? This person has frequent allergies and side effects to medication, but has got on fine with PTU for five years. Uh, oh, their endocrinologist now wants them to have definitive treatment, but they are worried they won't get on with the new tablets. Problems with levothyroxine are incredibly mm. rare. Mm. It's probably one of the most well-tolerated drugs. Uh, side effects or perceived side, side effects are very, very few. Would you like to add anything to that, Steve? Um, I can only remember one patient who truly had an allergy to thyroxine, and it wasn't the levothyroxine, it was the oil, the nut oil that was used in the preparation that she was taking. <coughs> and so we switched to a different brand and she was fine. So a lot of the allergies are the excipients that are in the medication. And yes, um, if that were a problem, which is, as Salman says, a very unusual situation, 
we would try a different brand to see which brand suited the patient. But I've no, not come across any patient who we can't find a formulation of thyroxine that they can't take. We may have covered this before. How long after radioactive iodine would you say patients stabilize after treatment? Everyone's different. It, yeah. it depends on their underlying cause. It depends on the dose of the radioactive iodine. It depends on a number of, of various factors. So there's no one size fits all criteria, I, I would say, for this. Yes, I agree. Right, next one. How do this person gets checked for thyroid eye disease prior to radioactive iodine treatment as they're very worried about having treatment and that triggering thyroid eye disease. Your clinician should be doing that, I, I would say, but yes. Steve. Yes, no, absolutely. Clinicians, you, you should be first of all referred to a specialist endocrine clinic. Uh, endocrinologists know how to assess and score your uh, eye condition. If we are worried about a patient's eyes or we find a high score or clinical activity score is high, we refer you to an eye clinic and you will be seen by an ophthalmologist. Your pressures will be measured. You will be properly assessed, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it does start uh, with the specialist and it goes from there. Right. This is probably for you, Glenn. How does the standard non-personalized dose of radioactive iodine work if this person has restricted growth? So probably uh, has the, a smaller thyroid than the average. Um, I will give two parts to that answer. <laughs> Firstly, um, generally, as Steve said, there is more than enough radioiodine given to cope with any sized thyroid generally speaking. Um, the second point I would give is that, although you may have restricted growth, that, and I look to Stephen Salmon to correct me, I don't think that necessarily means that your thyroid is smaller. I had my thyroid um, measured in an experiment in Germany um, a year ago and found out that I've got a pathetically small thyroid mm. that is nothing to be proud of at all. So I would say that your thyroid size, as far as I know, is not necessarily <laughs> related to your build, but yeah. correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. It, you're, you're absolutely right. And we see uh, uh, large thyroids in, in short people and small thyroids in big people. So, yes, it's controlled by different mechanisms to your growth. And the next one is more a, a statement. It's a they're relaying a positive experience. They've had 550 megabacterials in February of last year for grave disease, and they're still currently used thyroid. Mm -hmm. um, and they would recommend having radioactive iodine. Well, good, excellent. Next question is, if this person has grave disease with a small goiter, will the goiter disappear if they have the radioactive iodine? Probably. Probably. It, it's when we say goiter, what we mean really is a very vascular thyroid, and that's reflected in the activity of the graves. So as the thyroid becomes normal levels, the size will probably shrink. It's not nodules, which don't tend to shrink. It's, it's a smooth thyroid. So yes, it will. Right. Next question. I think it's probably out of uh, remit today. Thoughts on possible causes of graves and treatment. So I think they've kind of generally covered that with, um, you know, trying to treat the underlying autoimmunity rather than the hyperthyroidism as such. How likely is one uh, to require a thyroidectomy after having radioactive iodine? I'm presuming this is r related to failed radioactive iodine. Therefore, the next step is a total thyroidectomy. I would say that's very, very unusual because um, if radioiodine so-called fails, um, we can give another dose of it. And um, it's very unusual to find a, a thyroid that won't, go, uh, won't uh, respond to sufficient radioiodine. Um, I guess there may be some odd case that the thyroid is that the iodine is not being taken up for some reason or the patient is no longer suitable for radioiodine for other reasons but um, uh, that would be an exceptional case I would say. 
Right, this person wants to keep on PTU long-term and not have radioactive iodine. How, does, how do they convince their endocrinologist? They are not keen as this person has been on their books for six years now, and they really want to see this person back to their GP. But they think that keep seeing the endocrinologist has to be there. I mean, I would say no one can give you any treatment against your will. So they can't gag you and, and you know, convince you to have it. Have a conversation with the endocrinologist, see what your concerns are, see why they would want you to have this. If after all that you still don't want to go ahead with it, I don't think you, you, you have to. And then it's you know, up to you and the GP and the endocrinologist how you work your arrangement between them of how they monitor uh, your condition. Would you like to add anything to that, Steve? I agree entirely, Salman. Uh, I have patients on long-term carbimazole or long-term PTU. That's their choice. They've gone in as long as my, my big thing is informed choice. I don't want you to do something and then you'll say to me, but you never told me that, or I didn't realize that. So as long as you've got the facts, you're, you're an adult, you've got your sensible if that's your choice and it's not an unreasonable choice and it may be the best choice for you, fair enough. Um, you know, um, that's, that's fine. Yeah, this one uh, is, this person had radioactive iodine 30 years ago, but obviously antibodies weren't checked then, but we didn't know about these antibodies. I think they were called long acting thyroid stimulators or LATS, yes. but I'm not even sure that was a, around 30 years ago even. Mm. The traps, not TPOs, are not raised now. So it was in doubt then if uh, this person had Graves or Hashimoto's. How long do traps stay raised for? I'd like to know the original reason this person needed radioactive iodine. It's very well, difficult. Uh, now. It, it, the reason that we've gone for 12 months to 18 months in Graves' disease is because we think that the antibody will have largely gone within that time, within a year to 18 months. That's why we give it for that length of time on the hope, in the hope that at the end of that, the antibody's gone and you're done. Um, but of course, it doesn't always go. There are centers that will remeasure, and we were doing this for a while at 12 months to see if the antibody is still there but it didn't really help us because there were still patients, even though the antibody was there, who remained in remission when we stopped it. And there are others who we couldn't detect the antibody and they relapsed. So um, I think that the answer is everyone's different. The antibody may persist or it may not, or it may not be detectable, or it may not actually be about antibodies. It may be more about another form of immunity, which we call cellular immunity or T cell immunity, which is going on in the thyroid. So immunology is another big complicated area which we could explore on another occasion. Right, this person uh, is not, an, not very unusual in the sense that some people do have this uh, issue. So this person gained weight rather than losing weight during the hyperthyroid phase mm -hmm. and now is concerned about weight gain after radioactive iodine, particularly as there a, is there a family history of, of heart disease. So after radioactive iodine, will it be easier to lose any weight gained? Well, um, weight is a funny thing. And um, uh, two things happen when you're overactive thyroid. One is that your metabolic rate goes up, which would tend to cause you to lose weight. At the same time, your appetite is stimulated. And in that combination, in some patients, and it's possibly more the older patient, the appetite stimulation is greater than the metabolic stimulation, uh, and they end up gaining weight. In other patients, more commonly and more classically, they lose weight. If you want to know what's going on, it probably relates to brown fat, which is a particular kind of fat that's more sensitive to thyroxine 
and some people have a lot of it. Uh, those are the skinny people who seem to be able to eat anything they like and never put on weight. We hate those people. And then there's the other group who have lots of white fat, which is metabolically uh, less active and they persist with overweight. So if you're a lucky individual, lots of brown fat, you become hypothyroid, you will lose weight. If you're not, then you might gain weight. Would radioiodine make you more likely to gain weight or more likely to lose weight? All radioiodine is doing is rendering you euthyroid, either hypothyroid and then thyroxine to get you back to euthyroid or euthyroid because it's reducing the level of thyroid hormones. So it's the effect of radioiodine on weight is indirect. It's indirect. It's working through the thyroid level as opposed to any direct effect on fat or fat cells. Right. Thank you. Next one is this person is currently on her third or their third uh, episode of carbimazole treatment in 14 years. Uh, is it safe to stay on carbimazole or should they really take radioactive iodine? Well, it comes back to the discussion that we have with our patients. There is an option for this patient to remain on carbimazole. It's safe. Um, there are small risks, but we've talked about, um, or have definitive treatment with radioiodine on the understanding that you're likely to become hypothyroid and require thyroxine. So, it's a discussion to be had. There are pros and cons to both approach, but either is safe. Either is safe. Are those risks dose dependent with carbimazole? Yes, I would say so. Um, we think that a low dose of carbimazole is safer than a high dose. And by high, I mean anything more than 30 milligrams. Yeah. Would patients having radioactive iodine in addition to having Graves' disease, have other multiple chronic illnesses, causing a level of disability leading to being mostly housebound. Is there any other risk to the other health conditions being worsened due to radioactive iodine? Not as far as I'm aware. And as Glenn has so eloquently said, the iodine is the magic bullet that goes only into the thyroid and to some extent into the salivary glands, um, but it doesn't go into other tissues, so no. Okay, the next one is again, uh, just a thanks for, for the very informative uh, seminar or webinar. Next one, if the entire thyroid is removed in grave disease, does this mean that the radioiodine also destroys the entire thyroid? I'm assuming they mean that does radioactive iodine also destroy the entire thyroid? Um, well, um, if it may functionally destroy the thyroid, because that's why you need lifelong thyroxine. If you're saying, are there any surviving thyroid cells after you've given uh, radioiodine? Um, in a patient with thyroid cancer, we might knock out every last cell by giving giga doses of um, or giga activities of megabecquerels, but in these mega doses that we give, no, I don't think it knocks out every last remaining thyroid cell. But the next one is also a, a note about, you know, of appreciation uh, for all your presentations and the answers. Question, will radioactive iodine shrink this person's goiter? Hmm. Uh, there is some evidence in a patient with an overactive thyroid, um, radioiodine, particularly Graves, will shrink a smooth thyroid. In a patient with a nodular thyroid, <laughs> it's far less likely. Um, there, there was a vogue for using radioiodine in large doses for euthyroid goiters. Um, and this was used in conjunction with recombinant TSH. So you really tried to get enough radioiodine into the thyroid, but it's not much done now. And I don't think it was particularly effective. So yes, you would expect a smooth thyroid to go down a little, 
with radioiodine, it won't do much for a nodular thyroid. If you are giving a patient radioactive iodine for an overactive thyroid and they didn't have any eye problems, would you give them a small dose of prednisolone or put them on a low dose of thyroxine? This person, the reason why they ask this question is they develop thyroid eye disease following radioactive iodine, but they're not given any medication prior. Mm. Well, it's not recommended to give steroid. What that patient's really, what that person's really asking is, should everybody who gets radioiodine get a dose of prednisolone in order to prevent the possibility of thyroid eye disease developing? And that is not recommended by any, as far as I know, by any specialist authority. It's, it's, it's because the incidence is, doesn't justify the risk of the steroid itself. So um, I think the answer is nobody would do that. But if the patient was assessed pre-radioiodine and found to have evidence of thyroid eye disease, even minor degrees of thyroid eye disease, then we would, we would probably give uh, some prednisolone. Next one, what symptoms would you expect nine months after radioactive iodine treatment, such as muscle pains, joint pains, or tiredness? I think the short answer is I, would, I wouldn't expect any symptoms mm -hmm. in relation to the radioactive iodine treatment. However, you can get symptoms of an underactive thyroid if that has happened. And likewise, if some people may have, you know, recurrence of the hyperthyroidism, which can also happen, that could also give you symptoms. But the radioactive iodine itself shouldn't. Yep, I agree. Right. Uh, how long must one wait for a thyroidectomy after having several surgeries for thyroid eye disease? Mm. Can you repeat that? How long must one wait for a thyroidectomy after having several surgeries for thyroid eye disease. Oh, I see. So um, this question is um, the risk of having repeated general anesthetics and more surgery. I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't have your thyroid operation uh, at any stage, um, but you would want to have recovered from your thyroid eye surgery before having another operation and more general anesthesia. But there's, um, I, um, I can't really give a figure or a, a time interval. I think it would be when you're fit to have your surgery. And I think an, an anesthetist would probably be best place to, to make that judgment and decision. Mm. Mm. Right, and I think the last two are kind of, you know, votes of uh, appreciation for this and, Huge thanks to everyone involved tonight. Very useful, inform informative, clear, and pleasantly presented. And you all give us extra time willingly. Uh, many thanks. Oh, that's your vote of thanks all already done, Julia. And I think that brings us to, uh, uh, and oh, are there more? <laughs> oh, no. Um, Thank it's you, for, thank you, thank for Glenn, you. It's for Glenn. <laughs> it's, it might be for Glenn. <laughs> yeah. What happens with your long? No, it's for long-term carbamazole patients, and are you and you talking years and years? Do you see them annually to review their medication levels? Do they go back to the GP and just get repeat prescriptions and bloods? Um, I I do it virtually. I don't necessarily see the patient, but they they need their thyroid levels monitored. Right, and at this point, I think this may be the last question, but we might have more while I'm still asking this question. A patient couldn't get graves after having a full thyroidectomy, can they? No. Well, they no can't get a, yeah, they can't get in graves or active thyroid, but they still have the autoimmune. Yes, yes they can have the antibody, but there's no target to, for the antibody to work on. But the other important thing is once in patients with grave disease, once they've had the thyroidectomy, it's invariably true that the antibody levels go down remarkably. Mm. Mm. Yes, there is one more other question. Lost four stones in two months, two years ago, and looked ill, and now have got, gained two stones. 
levels are in range now. So there is a diet to help or foods to avoid. If, if I'm in range, I have grades. My father had his pituitary gland removed, so not sure what to do. Um, sorry, I'll have to read through that again. Mm. Lost four stone in two months, two years ago, and looked ill, have now gained two stones. My levels, I'm presuming thyroid hormone levels, are in range now. So is there a diet to help or foods to avoid, uh, presumably for weight gain? For some, because they'd lost four stones in the past, but they've only gained two stones back. And this person has Graves' disease. Well, it sounds to me as if when her thyroid levels were high, she lost an awful lot of weight. And as she's been treated, I'm assuming, the weight has started to come back up. Um, whether she was at her ideal weight when she lost that four stone or whether um, she needs to to gain that whole all the level it's all about what her thyroid uh, levels are doing um, in terms of diet um, there is no specific diet if she wants to um, it, as she should be on a healthy diet um, if she, I don't advocate eating lots of fatty foods to try and put on weight. If her thyroid's still overactive, then it won't help. Um, so it's not about diet, it's about weight, uh, about the thyroid levels. Fine, and I think we'll uh, take these last two questions and then draw a line under that. Uh, if you have nodules, do you have risk of thyroid cancer in the future? That's a good question. Um, Thyroid nodules is another discussion, really, another talk. Um, there is, there are different, we, we classify nodules in, in different ways using the ultrasound and if necessary, using the cell type by fine needle aspiration. And depending on the type, by the classification, we can give a risk of progression or not. So there are very benign ones that, that we don't worry about, which we classify. And there are some that are indeterminate that we do worry about that could progress. So I don't think you can give a straight answer to that, but it depends very much on the nature of the nodule. And I think overall, the vast majority of these nodules will be benign mm. uh, and cancer is relatively much rarer. Mm. Final question. and. This is, is Graves' disease the same as thyroid eye disease? Uh, no, um, thyroid eye disease describes the appearance of the eyes, which may be in, is seen in some patients with Graves' disease, but it can actually occur in other autoimmune thyroid disease, such as Hashimoto's disease, you can get a similar appearance. So it's, it's a separate entity describing what's happening in the eyes, often and associated with patients with Graves disease. Right, thank you. And I think, I'm, I'm not sure, is it just the five of us left on, on this? <laughs> <laughs> no. But they were amazing, there are 50, 50 people have hung on to the end. Oh, right, yeah. okay, thank so you. I think we, we've covered all the questions. So no, thank you very much, guys. Over to you, Julia. Um, I'll just put up my, my, my final screen for you. No, hang on. No, hang on. Oh, sorry, share. Sorry, everybody. Yeah. Is it there? Yeah, we yeah, can it's see there. it. Okay. Not on the last one. Next. There we go. Um, thank you so much to uh, Salman, Glenn and Steve for uh, an extremely useful, interesting and wonderful and extended session. Um, and for all the questions, we had over 70 questions, which we've never had before. And we've certainly never had half as many answered. So we really appreciate the fact that you all gave your time so freely tonight. Um, this is such a great opportunity for for the patients and others who were on the call to find out so much more so we're, we're grateful that you gave us that extra time
And I really hope that the meeting has helped everybody who was on the call learn much more about radioactive iodine and also some of the related endocrine questions about Graves' disease and hypothyroidism. If you joined late or didn't write everything down, again, for those who've missed um, the end of it, we, the meeting was recorded and the webinar will be up on our YouTube channel so you can catch up with it in your own time and take a break when you need to for the full two hours. Um, normally I would say if you've got any other questions get in touch afterwards. I think all the questions were answered but if you've got any questions that um, come to mind after the this meeting's ended then please get in touch and we'll do our best to answer them for you. If you've not already seen the BTF website please do have a look. As our speaker said, one of the most important things is that patients are informed and that's why organisations like the BTF um, do all we do to help you become informed and to give you uh, access to the information that will help you make the, the right decisions for you and your care. Uh, as a follow-up to this meeting in particular, there's some really helpful fact sheets about radioactive iodine uh, and radioactive iodine therapy on our website, which Glenn and his team at the Royal Marsden produced. So again, you could find them on our website if you'd like to know more about radioactive iodine and the physics of it. Our website also has got a lot of information about the support networks that the BTF has. Um, so we've got a very active Facebook group for thyroid eye disease and hypothyroidism. If you're not a member of that already, please consider joining it. It's a closed group, but there's a fantastic support network of people there who, who uh, other patients who will answer your questions and share their experiences, which I know most people find extremely helpful. We've already had a few ideas about uh, future meetings. So thanks to the people who put those ideas into the, into the chat box. Um, we've got lots of ideas for, um, for, for some future webinars, including something about thyroid function tests, maybe thyroid nodules and swellings as well. Something specifically but about that would be helpful. So finally, if you've enjoyed the webinar tonight and all you've learned, please do consider making a donation to support the work of the BTF or uh, become a member of our organisation. Like many other charities all over the world, our fundraising income has declined dramatically in the last year. But we've been working harder than ever to make sure patients have had access to the information they've needed. It's just £25 or £15 for a concession new membership. And there are lots of membership benefits like our regular fantastic newsletter and e-bulletins that come through every couple of months. And you'll also be helping to fund research into thyroid disorders. So you'll be helping improve the lives of patients in the future. And a lot of the research which has been referred to tonight, particularly with regard to graves and um, antibodies, we're involved in. And as a BTF member, you'll have more opportunities to become involved in supporting that research. So once again, thank you to everybody who stayed to the end of the meeting tonight. We know you've all got other things to do in your evening. So we're so um, grateful that you chose to, to stay with us and learn, take part tonight. Thank you enormously to our speakers, to Salman, Glenn and Steve for giving up so much of their time, twice as much as they thought they were going to be giving up and to answer so many brilliant questions. Please stay in touch with the BTF and we look forward to your taking part in future events with us. Good night and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Salman. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Glenn.